Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this week's Everton show. The clock's ticking, isn't it, for Wembley? But all our focus this week, well, most of it anyway, is on the Premier League. Following a draw with Watford last week, we drew 0-0 at Crystal Palace on Wednesday night, that despite being down to 10 men. And of course, the Saints come marching to Goodison on Saturday. It's a huge pleasure this week on the Everton show to welcome Kevin Sheedy. And it's always a pleasure to welcome Snod as well. Good evening, gentlemen. A point and a clean sheet away at Crystal Palace on a Wednesday night. Not to be sniffed at, Kev. No, a decent point. Um, they have been struggling recently at home but still Sellers Park is a great atmosphere and it's always a, a difficult one both teams had chances um, obviously James McCarthy getting sent off um, you know point in the end was, was a decent result and the clean sheet the lads will take confidence from that Indeed, yes. I mean, we've been leaking far too many goals, so a clean sheet will give the defenders and, and the goalkeeper confidence. Good platform for the rest of the season. And I'm sure we'll thoroughly enjoy the company of our two legends on this week's show. And I'm sure we'll also enjoy listening to this week's other contributors too. I thought Joel was very good in goal and we had to defend well at times. And sometimes them points are very satisfying, you know, and, and we can definitely uh, build on that. It's always nice to, to play at Goodison. The lads always look forward to it. The, you know, there's an extra buzz about them when it's at Goodison and uh, under the lights and you know two two home games now at Goodison and uh, it's a great opportunity to, to end the season with two wins there. It's a good feeling to score a goal but to be honest the most important thing is, is, is getting three points at this moment in time and I would have certainly took the all three points if I, if I couldn't get on the score sheet today. It's uh, nice to be here and um, nice to train here. I can train with the team, it's uh, fantastic for me and uh, I'm, uh, I enjoy. To be quite honest, uh, I, I say I scored a goal in the cup final because people say, oh, it's the winning goal. But without the other two, it wouldn't be, would it? So I scored one of the, you know, the goals. It turned out it was the last one. Well, the fixtures are coming thick and fast right now for Everton, and on Wednesday night, the team made one of the most awkward journeys in the Premier League. Selhurst Park is not an easy place to get to, and after we'd had James McCarthy sent off in the second half against the Eagles, Seamus Coleman gave us his reaction to what was a very solid point from a 0-0 draw. We came down here wanting all three points, and we come down here to, to play well and, and go home with the three points, which wasn't the case, but uh, circumstances during the game with James unfortunately getting sent off meant that we were going to be back to the wall and I thought Joel was very good in goal and we had to defend well at times and sometimes them points are very satisfying you know and, and we can definitely uh, build on that. The punters were certainly satisfied weren't they with the points and with the display there was a real togetherness out there. Yeah look you know the, the fans no matter how good or how bad we, we're doing in the league they, they turn up and they've, they've uh, turned up again tonight and uh, we wanted to put on a performance for them and you know Unfortunately for us and them, performances this season haven't been good enough and we're desperate to put that right and you know we wanted to be solid from the back and I think we were so and unfortunately you know Ross had a few chances, I had a, I had a chance, the keeper done well and we couldn't get that win but um, positive result enough, yeah. You mentioned there that Joe Robles played well, so did Wayne Hennessy, again it was a terrific save from you wasn't it, you couldn't have done much more. No, it was a great ball from Baza and you know... I've looked at my own game, you know, the last the last couple of months, and I haven't been getting in them positions where I used to where I used to get in. And you know, I've I've had a talk about it, and you know, I've decided to start getting back in at the back post. And um, you know, I made the run and then got in, and it was a great ball from Baza at the back post. And I've just tried to connect connect with the ball, and you know, unfortunately, it didn't go in. I could have went in, but uh, please God, between now and then, the season, I'll be creeping up again at the back post and starting to score some goals. And there'll be more from Seamus a little bit later on, by the way. Well, after three straight defeats in the Premier League, Everton went to Watford last weekend hoping to stop the rot. James McCarthy got himself on the score sheet just before half-time, but there was still time for Watford to go in level at the break. So it was somewhat of a bittersweet afternoon for our Republic of Ireland international. To be honest, the most important thing was just coming here and trying to get three points, which is disappointing within the squad. Uh, in the dressing room, we know that we, we should have... Took all three points, especially the chances we had second half, and it's, it's just disappointing uh, not to come away with maximum points. You finished it nicely when you won the ball, though, didn't you? Yeah, it was just nice. It's, it's a good feeling to score a goal, but to be honest, the most important thing is, is, is getting three points at this moment in time, and I would have certainly took the all three points if I, if I couldn't get on the score sheet today. When you take the lead in stoppage time at the end of the first half, you expect to be leading at half-time, really, don't you? Yeah, we've, we conceded um, from a set-piece, and... We had a talk at half time and then after the game we know it's not good enough. Um, we should be doing better and um, 
as I, as you say, we, we scored right on half time and then to concede a minute later, it's, 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 it's a real disappointment within the squad. And each and every one of us know that we need to bounce back and we've got a game Wednesday and we look we look we look forward to that now. Is it good to visit other games so quickly? Yeah, that's it. We, 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 it's a good thing that we've got a game Wednesday and as I say, we need to, we need to start getting wins on the board and finishing this season strongly and obviously a lot of people are talking about the FA Cup but the most important thing is just now is is getting points on the board and kicking up this table. It's a good old fashioned battle out there at times today. You can see why Watford haven't been struggling, can't you? Yeah, they're, they're a good side and as you say, the they're not afraid to put the tackle in. Um, at times the, the pitch was a bit bobbly, um, but as you say, it was it was a good battle out there. And as I say, I thought we just edged it, and we certainly should have went on to win the three points with the chances we created second half. It's a busy old schedule now, isn't it? The games come thick and fast, but I suppose that's what you want, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. It's, there'll be not much training, obviously, and uh, certainly a lot of games coming up. And as you say, that, that's what you want as a footballer. You want to be playing in games and uh, a lot of big games coming up. So now, when you look at it, a draw away at Watford, a draw away at Crystal Palace, nothing really to write home about, but it was important that we didn't lose either of those games, wasn't it? Yeah, when, when the fixtures come out and Watford came up from uh, the Championship, we played them first game of the season and you're thinking what a big disappointment that were, a 2-2 draw, but you've seen how well they've done this season and to go down there and draw uh, one each was, uh, was a decent result. Just wish we could have kept hold of the lead for a little bit longer, obviously. We scored and then straight after we conceded, so that, that were that were disappointing. But overall, I think uh, it was a half-decent game at Watford. Uh, we played quite well, perhaps should have won the game. And against Crystal Palace, uh, nil-nil is not a bad result, mm. but uh, clean sheet, as we've talked to uh, Kev about it. The lads will be delighted with that, but overall, uh, we got two points out of the two games. Wayne Hennessy had another great game. He played ever so well for Palace at Goodison and he did so again the other night. Yeah, he did. And uh, when you get people uh, in that kind of form, it's a bit frustrating really uh, for our strikers and for the for the lads getting attempts on goals. But Joel also played well mm. uh, that evening and pulled a couple of good saves off himself. We heard from James McCarthy there, Sheeds. How pivotal is he to the Republic of Ireland next summer? Yes, both he and Seamus, um, you know, it's a great tournament, I, mean, I cast my mind back, 1988 I played in, in Germany, uh, fantastic memories, atmospheres, um, so they'll be really looking forward to that, obviously they'll have one eye on that and, um, you know, it's something they can look back when their careers are finished to, to say they've played them and, you know, James in top form will be one of the, the players there for Ireland if we're going to do well there. Are they certain starters, do you think, Seamus and Jamesy? I think so. I think the form needs to keep going between now and the end of the season. And Seamus' interview there, you know, he needs to get a few more goals, probably, you know, getting in the back post. Um, and I'm sure if they, they hit good form, I'm sure they'll be starting in, uh, in France. The Irish people will enjoy it anyway, won't they? They always do. They enhance every single tournament. Right, let's now switch our attentions to the under-21s. David Unsworth has done a fine job with the young players this season and their good form continued unabated earlier this week when they beat Chelsea at Southport's Mersey Rail Community Stadium. Here's the goals and the reaction from Unzi and skipper Joe Williams. The under-21s made it back-to-back -back league wins with an impressive 2-0 victory over Chelsea at Southport on Monday evening. During a first half which the Young Blues dominated, Harry Charsley went close early on, striking the underside of the crossbar after good work by fullback back Gethin Jones on the right flank. Ten minutes before the half-time interval, David Unsworth side struck the woodwork again. This time, Kieran Dowell's driven free kick evaded everyone before crashing off the post and away from danger. For all the host dominance, Chelsea nearly opened the scoring themselves within 60 seconds of the second period. Islam Farouz was sent through on goal, but Matthias Huelp pulled off an excellent save to turn the striker's effort around the post. And Everton eventually made the breakthrough ten minutes later. Another dangerous set piece from Dow was met by Callum Connolly, whose header went through a sea of bodies, possibly even taking a final touch off Anthony Evans before creeping into the net. The win was then sealed in added time as a clever corner routine involving Dowell and Charsley was turned in by Mason Holgate at the far post. Next up for the under-21s is a home game against Manchester City at Goodison on Monday. A tough game out there and in difficult conditions, just, just how difficult was it? Yeah, and, um, you're, you're constantly trying to take an extra few touches to get the ball under control because obviously the pitch, the pitch isn't that good. Um, the weather over Christmas and Southport playing there every week, so we were struggling to play play footy on the pitch. But I thought the lads coped with it well. We struggled against Redden, and we we learned our lesson today, and we played um, we played to the conditions very well. A game against Man City now at Goodison next week. How much looking forward to that one? Yeah, it's always nice to to play at Goodison. The lads always look forward to it. The, 
you know, there's an extra buzz about them when it's at Goodison and uh, under the lights and you know, two two home games now at Goodison and uh, it's a great opportunity to, to end the season with two wins there and uh, nothing more did this, than they deserve because they've been absolutely brilliant this season. Kev, we feature Unzi every week on the Everton show. He's done a smashing job with the under-21s this season and you know most of those boys really well. Yes, uh, they've all obviously come through the, the under-18s. Uh, we won the under-18 Premier League with, with a lot of those players and it's nice to see them progressing. Uh, some of them have gone out on loan, some of them are still playing with the 21s and hopefully you know, they, they can continue to improve, hopefully get into our first team, if not make careers, you know, that wherever they'll ever get them. But certainly at this moment in time, it's probably the, the best crop that we've had through at the same time. Joe Williams speaks well. He's he's young for a captain, isn't he? He is indeed. Yes, Joe's always been a, been a good player, and he's obviously progressing. And uh, you know, Franzi to make him captain when there's other players that maybe he could as well. So it just speaks volumes for Joe. And very quickly, nearly another wonder goal for Kieran Dow. Yes, indeed. I mean, I always like players with a left foot, so I'm a bit biased <laughs> towards that. But uh, no, he's got a great left foot, and he's obviously developing. So uh, hopefully, you know, we can continue his progress. Great left foot and a great future, that's for sure. And that eases us gently into the first break of this week's programme. After a few adverts, we'll be getting under the skin of the football club when we hear from this eclectic mix. We've got Speedo Mick, Mike Pender from the Searchers, and our Switzerland international striker, Sharni Tarashai. Where else would you get those three in one show? Welcome back to part two of this week's programme. Now, there was a bit of drizzle around the Walton area of Liverpool on Tuesday morning. It was overcast and there was a chill in the air. But that didn't stop Michael Cullen from starting his epic charity walk from Goodison Park to Wembley in just a pair of training shoes, a pair of swimming trunks and a swimming cap. This crazy guy is better known to Evertonians, of course, as Speedo Mick. Well, I'm going to uh, be walking to, from Goodison to Wembley uh, for the FA Cup uh, semi-final. I was thinking before the uh, we played Chelsea, I was thinking if we get to Wembley, I've got to walk to Wembley. Do you know what I mean? And we did, we beat them. It's, it's, it's a big, big undertaking that, isn't it? What do you think the next few days are going to be like? Well, it's going to be a little bit difficult. So to be honest, I haven't really done that much training. Been really, really busy. You know what I mean? But I'm a very determined man, and it's going to be painful, but it's it's going to be interesting to say the least. <laughs> Hats off to him, he's an absolute legend to walk all that way. To think that, you know, it's like a couple of weeks away and we're all like thinking, getting excited for it and he's starting his journey today. It's just amazing. We set up a fan page, a few of us, um, vote Michael Cullen fan of the year um, for this season. So there's that, there's the fan page where we'll be updating all the time, the admin on that we'll be posting. Um, he's got like a real time app of where um, you can follow that and check out even where he is. Um, so obviously we're here to send him off, but we want people to look after him on his long journey ahead of him. I just want to say thank you very, very much to Everton Football Club for the support that you gave me throughout the season and especially the Everton supporters. You've been fantastic, you know what I mean? I know it's a bit of a, um, a loopy idea to raise money for charity, but you have all you have donated £33,000 for the Woodlands Hospice Man and that is just brilliant. Thank you very much. Snods, we've got to know Michael Cullen, Speedo yeah. Mick, a little bit over the last few months. He won't mind us referring to him as that crazy guy, will he? Oh, when I first seen him at a game, I uh, seen him behind the, behind the goals, I thought, what's he doing? I just couldn't believe what were happening. A, a fan watching a game of football in just his Speedos. And, uh, but now, now we've got to know him, we've met him a couple of times. He's a great lad, doing fantastically well for charity. Mm. Uh, the Woodlands Hospice as well has benefited from him. So, uh, no, you take your hats off to him. It's a long, long walk. And uh, I believe he's coming back, Daz, is he, for the Derby game as well? He's uh, getting picked up by his missus, mm. brought back up to Merseyside for the Merseyside Derby and then taken back down to wherever she picks him up from. Incredible. It just shows that he doesn't even want to miss an Everton game, especially the Derby game as well. So, no, you've got to take care. Uh, I would say your hat's off to him, but uh, he's speedo <laughs> out there. But uh, no, he's, he's, he's done fantastically well. He's well known around the country now, mm. uh, speedo Mick, so great credit to him. You weren't tempted to join him? Not in my speedos, does no. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, if you want to donate to Speedo Mick's cause, which is the Woodlands Hospice in Liverpool, then simply visit justgiving.com forward slash speedo Mick. Justgiving.com forward slash speedo Mick. Great cause and a great guy. 
Right, let's go back to the 60s now. Hits like Sweets for My Sweet and Needles and Pins made the Liverpool band The Searchers one of the top Mersey Beat groups of the era. They were mentioned in the same breath as The Beatles and Jerry and the Pacemakers. One of the original Searchers members and still part of the band to this day is Mike Pender. He's a lifelong Evertonian, Mike, and it was my absolute pleasure to catch up with him recently at Goodison Park. I've been a blue forever, yeah. Um, and obviously I'm, I'll be a blue until I go. But um, I've been a bit of an armchair fan now. Um, I think you get you get like that when you get to my age. Who did you enjoy watching when you were a kid? Well, if I go further back for when I used to come, my dad brought me here when he was a big fan of Dave Hickson. Um, and obviously, uh, I can't remember, he used to sit me on one of them bars, you know. Yeah. And then I went to the boys' pen. And of course, when we started coming regular in the 60s, it was the Golden Vision. Alec Younger, and I got to know Alec very, very well, actually. Mm. Um, my wife and I used to go up to Scotland and have holidays with them, and we'd take them away to Tenerife, to our place that we've had over there for a number of years now, and we still go over there. Um, in fact, I've, I've got a book out, and there's a great picture of Alec and I dancing together. <laughs> <laughs> and I, every time I look at it, I go, I bet it's a few Evertonians <laughs> like to be doing that. That's worth getting the book just to see Alec Young dancing in Tenerife, well, isn't there it? There you go. It must have been strange or at times tricky for you to come to the game in the 60s, Mike, because for a certain period of time, you, you and the lads were probably as famous, if not more famous, than the players. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far to say that, but of course, in the music business and the football business, it's completely different. I mean, you know, the lads come along here on Saturday, um, they probably don't live too far away. Um, but of course, yeah, we were in all parts of the world in the 60s. Um, we'd go to America, Australia, uh, South Africa. Um, to a certain extent, we still go to get, we still go today. And I'm in New York this year for a week. I uh, can't remember the name of the hotel, but it's like a nostalgic thing. Mm. Um, so after 50 odd years, I'm amazed that people still want us to go to America. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, you've still got a lot of people who want to hear nostalgic music. Would you swap a number one song in the hit parade for scoring a goal at Goodison? Definitely. <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd love to be a footballer today. Um, yes, and I would swap it all to be, you know, plain and be as big as the, the players that Everton have got today. There you go. They float your boat snods, the searchers. Any kind of music for me, but it's more Sheeda's era. That is it, the 60s <laughs> rather than mine, but uh, I'm into any kind of music. Some that's upbeat, gets you going before a game. Uh, I know Sheeds will want to tell you who, uh, who got him going uh, during a football game or before the football game. Uh, but Nev used to be in charge, didn't he, Sheeds of uh, Indeed, yeah. I Get a Blaster? It's a big part of the pre-match ritual, isn't it, the music? Yeah, players are very superstitious, so we used to play the same songs on the way to matches, sort of thing. It sounds like Chris Rea, uh, Bruce Springsteen. Um, when I was playing for Ireland, we had the same routine. We'd somebody put the, I'd like to say D DVD, but it was a cassette in those days, and uh, just the same music, and he just, he's like motivational, as they'd call it now, and, uh, you know, it certainly worked. Some of your under 18 lads must play some rubbish, though, Kev. Oh, I do. I have to go out of the dressing room because it's uh, <laughs> obviously a different style of music. But whatever, whatever gets them going, sort of thing. Like you know, and they've got to play some good ones now and again when they play the old ones. But the the new music they play is not really my my scene. We have into the Beatles snobs. Yeah, like the Beatles. I like any kind of music, any sing along music, any not, not so much dance music. Cause weren't weren't really a dancer, me. Uh, but <laughs> more of a singer. More of a singer. Yeah, I could <laughs> sing a tune, but uh, oh, any kind of music that uh, you enjoyed and got you going. I were into all kinds. Good job, this is not a karaoke show, by the way. These two are just warming up here. Well, during the recent international break, the Switzerland debut of Shani Tarashai went pretty much under the radar. The striker, who we signed in January and then loaned straight back to Grasshoppers, played twice for the Swiss, including a game in Dublin against Ireland. Whilst near these shores, he took the opportunity to call into Finch Farm and catch up with the guys who next season will be his teammates. Yeah, very good. I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's uh, nice to be here. Um, nice to train here. To can train with the team is uh, fantastic for me, and uh, I'm, uh, I enjoy. How has it come about that you've had the chance to come over here then? Obviously, the Swiss season is still going on. How have you come across here? Why have you come across here to, to train? Yeah, I think the, the two clubs uh, speak together and uh, also with me, and uh, we find a solution to, to come here to train to two or three days to be here. Just to see all the players again, and uh, it's yeah, fantastic. 
Have all the players said hello and, and welcomed you into the group? Yes, uh, I speak with all the players. Uh, they are very good and yeah, I'm happy. Who have you spoken to most then since you've, you've been over here this week? Yeah, I met him uh, with Bezic because he speaks German. <laughs> And but uh, also with other other players, but uh, the most most time I'm, I speak with the uh, message. Just talk about the last last two weeks for you because it, it's been a big couple of weeks for you making your your Switzerland debut. How how has that all gone? Was it has it been a fantastic experience for you? Yeah, it was uh, was fantastic um, to play with the with the first team from Switzerland uh, to make my debut and um, yeah. We play, I play against uh, Everton players, <laughs> against Ireland and Bosnia. Yeah, it was a good feeling, and uh, I hope uh, we can go, we can go uh, far away in the European Championship. Stodds, we obviously don't know too much about young mm. Shani Tarashai, but we loaned him straight back to Grasshoppers, and he's clearly doing well in the Swiss League because he's forced his way into the international reckoning. Yeah, and it's great. 19-year-old, uh, obviously our scouting system and uh, Roberto have seen him play, uh, looked at him and thought, yeah, he's one for the future. And rightly so, loan him back to his club, he'll, he'll be confident there and give him a fresh start when he comes next season. But he came in to meet the players as well. He's played against a couple of the players. Obviously, James is having a little tug <laughs> of his shirt there. So, uh, yeah, it'd be nice for him to have come over for a week and got to meet all the lads properly. But also, loan him back to his club to get some more games in as well. People will say you score goals in the Swiss League, but the goals are the same size. You've still got to put the ball in the back of the net, haven't you? Of course, yeah. Yeah, without, without a question you have. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him. Really am. Kev, it's great to have you on the show. We featured the Dallas Cup recently. That was a terrific experience. And I was interested that you said it was one of your best nights in football. Now, you've had some big nights in football, so that's some statement. Yes, we were in a really inexperienced squad. We took four schoolboys, five under-18s. It was an under-19 tournament and the players really gave it their all. Um, it was a tough demanding schedule um, and we ended up with five games in, in ten days. So the lads had to really dig deep and I was really proud of their, their efforts and deservedly won it. So it was always nice and I, I got my first dice in, in management as well to go with it. So, uh, <laughs> But no, it was really, really great experience for the players to look back on uh, that they've, they've achieved something there. So really, really proud of the lads. And as well as the football, they learn about how to represent Everton and football club in a tournament like that? Yeah, it's massive. I mean, the PR we did, you know, we went to visit some of the uh, supporters clubs and the lads were right and they, they behaved impeccably as they always do. They realised they represented a great club of, of ours and uh, they do did, did it really in style. Everybody was absolutely delighted. Toffees, both sides of the Atlantic. And that's it for part two of this week's Everton show. After the break, we'll be back with our popular big interview slot and our subject this week is one of only five men to have ever scored a winning goal in an FA Cup final for Everton. Don't miss the absolute legend and the absolute gentleman that is Derek Temple. Welcome back to part three. It's big interview time now, and on a May afternoon, 50 years ago next month, Derek Temple made himself an Everton hero for life. The Blues were trailing Sheffield Wednesday 2-0 in the FA Cup final before the hitherto unknown Mike Trebilco pulled a couple of goals back, paving the way for Derek to score the winner. A hero, yes. A legend, absolutely. The man is both, but you'd never know it. Enjoy the charming company now of Derek Temple. 50 years ago, it, it's, uh, it's tremendous, isn't it? I... I, I uh... It does. It doesn't. It doesn't seem that long ago. You know. I mean. It's. Um, uh, I can't. I've got some great memories, and that's one of the one of them. You know, one of the great memories I have. It's. Uh, I, I, at the time, uh, the the uh, we had players that were in our uh, after the FA Cup win, uh, the likes of Bill Dean, Dixie Dean, Sam Chedsoy. Uh, Billy Cook, Norman Greenalsh, I think, and uh, they, they, they'd won it 33 years ago. And I was thinking, blimey, that's an awful long time. And here we are now, 50 years, you know, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> I didn't think it'd be around 50 years' time. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, uh, wonderful memory. Tell us about the game itself then and how it unfolded, because it was a, a dramatic story. Well, it was, you know, we, we, it was a great play made of we, we'd not conceded a goal in, in any round, oh, and we, we were at the final. 
uh, it wasn't too long before that was dashed, you know, I mean, uh, I remember McCallio hitting a ball and Gordon West going to cover it, and he had it covered, and it hit Ray Wilson's heel and went in the other corner. And of course, not a very good omen, you know, that first bit of bad luck and you won down at Wembley. So uh, it was a matter of rolling up your sleeves and trying to get over that. And then the, the second goal just after half time for yes. Ford? Yes. We, we thought uh, it shouldn't have been allowed because um, I think it was Jim Fantham. Uh, it, it, the ball was hit, uh, Westy blocked it, uh, and it came back out. and. Uh, as um, Brian Harris went for it, I think Fantham blocked him off, held him off, and uh, it was it Ford, I think, uh, knocked it in. So we're two down, but uh, it was given. So we're, we're two down, and uh, we're, we're on the back foot. But uh, we, we we started to believe, you know, that there was still something there, and we started playing. Yeah. So what? What? I wonder what the. Oh, you can tell us about the the mentality then of, of the players. It's two 0 down. In an FA Cup final, there's 33 minutes, 32 minutes left in, in the game. What, what was the, the morale like at that point? Well, I know, I know for myself uh, that there'd, there'd been a little bit of a spell of uh, clubs failing in a final, but going back maybe within a year or two and putting it right. And I, that's, that was my thought. I thought, you know, we, it's it's sad, but we're going to have to come back and uh, next time, we're, next year, and do the same. We're going to have to, uh, we'll get the right result. Uh, it wasn't looking too good. They were cock a hoop, of course, two nil up. But it's, it's a funny thing when, in football. It still applies now. The, a club can be two nil up and get a goal against them, and they seem to put themselves under pressure then. It does. It does happen that way, you know. I mean, they're still leading by like a goal, uh, and yet it, it puts pressure on. And, and that 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 happened with uh, Sheffield Wednesday, you know. It was a perfect response from from ourselves, really, because we we got one back within a matter of minutes, wasn't it? And there was still time to go on and, and get more. Well, we did. Uh, little Mike, who, um, you know, I mean, I I always say, cometh the hour, cometh the man, and he was certainly. That certainly applied to Mike that, that day because he, he hadn't figured a lot in the first team. Uh, playing in the reserves or training, you could see he had an eye for goal and he could finish. Uh, but uh, to get two like that, uh, one with his right foot and one with his left, I think it was, he, uh, you know, tremendous finishing. Mm. So it's 2-2 two, two and, and step forward, Derek Temple. How did it feel to know that you scored the winning goal in an FA Cup final? Well, it doesn't register, Rob. You know, I mean, I... I'm a, uh, to be quite honest, uh, I, I say I scored a goal in the cup final because people say oh, it was the winning goal. But without the other two, it wouldn't be, would it? So I scored one of the, you know, the goals. It turned out it was the last one, but uh, it was it was good. It was, um, it, but it doesn't register straight away. It's it's probably the next day when you come back to the city, you know, and see all the fans uh, congregating. I uh, didn't know there were so many. Evertonians in Liverpool that time, you know, it was tremendous, tremendous reception. And, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 you, could, you couldn't better that. You couldn't better it. Um, where's your medal nowadays? Where do you, do you keep your FA Cup winners medal? Uh, it's, it's, it's in a drawer safe, you know, I, I, I don't have anything on display. Uh, I, I, it is, uh, I know where it is and it's safe, you know. It, it's in a draw, and if anybody wants to see it, I will show them it, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, very treasured, treasured medal, yeah. I was just going to lead on to uh, the FA Cup run for the current Everton team. There's lots of similarities when you look at uh, the story from this year and the, and the story from 66. The, the comparisons are that um, we've got United and we haven't conceded... A, a, a goal this season, which was the same as '66, which is uh, if you're looking for omens, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's it's good. And it'd be great for the, for the club to to win a, a trophy, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, would you? You know, I mean, uh, uh, it's it's over 20 years, is it? Uh, just about now that uh, we've we've picked up any silverware, so we are due. And I think myself, I do think that it runs in cycles. You know that. Uh, uh, you can go for so many years, but then you, you, you start to, to succeed.
We're here at Arton Institute, and this is a, a regular venue for you because you're, you, you're still out and about, you're still active, you still play your, your, your crown green bowling. Uh, uh, yeah, I try. I try and play, yes. Yeah, and enjoy it. It's, uh, it's that little bit of activity, you know, but uh, uh, it's a long close season through the winter, you know, and uh, I look forward to the start. But, of course, you can see outside now it's raining heavily and uh, it's not the best conditions for ground green. But uh, it'll, it'll get better and uh, we look forward to a, uh, an enjoyable season. Yeah, it, and look forward to Everton getting to Wembley and winning. Stodds, before we discuss just what a gentleman and a legend Derek Temple is, it was interesting to see him having to go on the crown green bowls there because you and Diamond have been up to the same thing this week. We have. That's our next challenge for the Snods and Diamond Challenge that will be played uh, in the fan zone and on the pitch uh, before the game against Southampton. But just looking at Derek's standard there, I don't think he's capable of beating me and Diamond, to be <laughs> honest. But, uh, yeah, he's... Great, it was a great game, great uh, great afternoon we had there at Aylwood. But is it tougher than it looks? It is tougher than it looks. Uh, I'm quite impressed with Derek there, to be <laughs> quite honest, but uh, it is tougher than what it looks. But uh, you're right, what a gentleman he is. Uh, met him on pff, several occasions every year. You'll meet him three or four times at former players, do's, does, and the Christmas lunches, etc. And you can't speak highly enough of him, he's a gentleman. You'd never dream from speaking to Derek Temple that he was a club legend, an FA Cup hero. Yeah, he's a real down-to-earth person, as I said, a real gentleman. It's a pleasure to talk to, you know, we can't spend enough time with him. He's a really lovely man. It's an incredible thing to be able to tell people, isn't it? I scored the winning goal for Everton in the FA Cup final. Indeed, there's not too many that can say that, so uh, no fair play to him, uh, he deserves that. I always remind Diamond of that. He could have scored, couldn't he, uh, <laughs> in the 95, but he missed a great opportunity that day. And Paul Rideout, everybody talks about Rideout's goal. It could have been Graham Stewart's, but unfortunately, it weren't. Talking of, <laughs> talking of Merseyside football legends, we'll move swiftly on. Uh, you both attended the funeral earlier this week of John King, the, uh, the former manager of Tramia Rovers, and with your connection with Tramia Rovers, you must have known John King quite well, Kev. Yeah, again, a lovely gentleman. Um, Tram is the most successful manager. I mean, the amount of players, ex-players that turned up for his funeral today, I think speaks volumes for how highly he was respected. And, uh, you know, as I say, some great times at, at Tramia, and I was there five years, so just out of respect, you know, I went along with Snods. Former Everton player as well, that's why the football club was represented, but he, the job he did at Tramia Rovers was incredible, wasn't it? Yes, getting them so close to the, uh, the Premiership and just, you know, the success they had, you know, getting to Wembley. Um, so he, he'll go down in Tramia's history as the, the best manager. Must have been some recognisable faces from Tramia's glorious recent past at the funeral starts. Yeah, and that's where it shows the respect that they had for him uh, as, as a manager. It, it was the same when our boss died, Howard Kendall, the Mountrex players turned up there. Exactly same uh, for Johnny King. There was, I think there were about 50 ex-Tramia players there and it, the, the church were full and well-respected man. Just going back to the football side, Kev, the Merseyside derby next week, three days before the FA Cup semi-final. What's your take on that? Um, it's a difficult one, but at the end of the day, it's a Merseyside derby and you've got to go out to win it. So uh, you can't focus on, on the Saturday, the semi-final, both massive games. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can, we can put in a good performance and get a result against them. Do we need to ask you what your abiding memory of playing at Anfield is? Um, putting a 25-yard free <laughs> kick in the top corner at the cop and uh, making a V-sign signal. Uh, I don't know what made me do it. It wasn't pre-planned. I know some players these days have pre-planned celebrations, but it was just... Uh, off the cuff, really, so uh, I'm glad I did it. <laughs> <laughs> They're not what they used to be, are they, Merseyside derbies? They'd end up six a side if they were. Yeah, I, I know the first one I played in, the lads just said to me, uh, Reedy it was in particular, uh, first Merseyside derby, he said, forget the ball for 20 minutes, just look after yourself. And it were a, a matter of that, because they were so frantic, the tattles were, were horrendous, some of the tattles. Uh, but to me, proper football. As, as people say, but no, there were, so, some tattles were really... I remember him doing one that I thought, how mm. can she do a tattle like that? It was horrendous, wasn't horrendous, it? Horrendous, dear me. He, he, he should probably get a 10-game ten, ten ban, but it was <laughs> Steve McMahon. He'd uh, done Neil Poynton just before. It was his first derby, and as Stodd said, I'd, I'd said to Nino, if you're going in for a 50-50, look after yourself, and if you're going in with Steve McMahon, go high as you want, and uh, <laughs> he didn't go high enough, so it was just a bit of retribution. The players could give as good as they got, couldn't they? Yeah, they could. Uh, the referee had let you have one or two as well uh, before he did start uh, getting the notebook out in in our days, not the yellow card. But uh, yeah, there were there were physical contact uh, contact in them games, and you had to look after yourself. It's another game to look forward to in a busy period, and that's part three. Nicely wrapped up after another short break, we'll begin to look ahead to the Barclays Premier League game at Goodison Park on Saturday afternoon when Southampton come to town. <laughs> Thank you. 
It's the fourth and final section of this week's programme and very shortly we'll start assessing the challenge that Southampton will bring to Goodison Park at the weekend. First though, we're going to get more from Seamus Coleman. The Irishman is as honest as the day is long on the pitch and that penalty incident at Selhurst Park proved that. And that continues off the pitch as well. Here he explains why the dressing room is so determined to finish this season on a high. You know, we've all got to stick together and be positive. As I said, it's been a long time since, since this club's won something too long. Big club, I'm here seven years and I'm desperate to win something. And, you know, league position, not good enough. No hiding behind the fact, not good enough. We can't, we can't explain that enough, but we can still win a, win a cup this season and we've got to all believe that. I speak to you after most games, but after a defeat or after you don't feel you've played awfully well, there's no way you can put a smile on your face, is there? No, look, um, when we're, we're, we're footballers, we're getting paid good money to do what we do and, you know, Man United away when we get beat 1-0, like, the fans go home disappointed but don't forget that, like, it hurts us as well, we go home, we don't just, you know, throw on a film and watch the TV and, and forget about it, it hurts us for a couple of days and, you know, that's what this club means to us, we want to do well and unfortunately it, it hasn't been the case, we're, we're in a position, we've got the best job in the world so we've, we've a right to be criticised week in, week out when we don't perform and that, ha that has been the case but as I said, we can, we can still turn this around and, and have a positive end to the season and that's what I'm desperate for. Just finally, we were poor at Manchester United but we've got a right good chance to turn that around, haven't we now? Yeah, very much so, um, you know, it was either are in the, either are in the draw, um, uh, United won tonight and it was going to be a tough game whoever we got but you know we owe them one after after that game and you know big pitch at Wembley we're, we're looking forward to it and it'll be a great day out for the fans and, and please God we can get to that final That'll be a nice afternoon for you to get on the back stick and finally pop one in Yeah definitely you know I've, I've only got one this season which hasn't been good enough for the for the way I play but as I said the last couple of games you know I've, I've creeped, creeped forward a bit more and getting back to what, what I should be doing and and, you know, I got in at the back post, didn't go in, but please God, between now and then the season, I can creep a couple in. Kev, what a fantastic football story this guy is. A young man from an Irish village of Killybegs, plays for Sligo Rovers. Now he's an international footballer for your country. Yeah, we were just discussing his, his rise. He came over for £60,000, I believe, which mm -hmm. is a, an absolute steal. Um, settled in and then he went on loan to, to Blackpool where he, he learned his trade, come back and I remember he coming on against Tottenham as a sub, changed the game, the supporters got right behind him because of his style of play, just wholehearted runs of players and uh, you know he's, he's, he's made himself a top player. What a cracking lad as well, Snods. Yeah, great lad. Uh, and he, so he says he's disappointed with the one goal this season. I'd have been delighted with one goal <laughs> from the right-back area. But uh, no, he is. He's a great lad. And he's, he's got as many as seven in one season from right-back. So, uh, yeah, he might be disappointed with his ratio this season. But he just gets in some unbelievable positions for a right-back in at the far post, in, in the middle of the goal with his header that he did actually score. So, um, yeah, he, he's, a, he's a great lad. Great footballer and uh, he's done his club and, and I'm sure he'll do his country proud in, in the Euros. As I mentioned in the intro to that piece of film, he's as honest as the day is long. There was contact in the penalty area against Crystal Palace but Seamus stayed on his feet. You shouldn't have to go down to get the penalty, surely? No, he's, a, he's an old-fashioned type player of that mentality. Mm. He, as a young player, he didn't go down, he didn't dive. Uh, it's in the modern game now and players do go down too easily. But you still need the referees to make the right decisions. If players don't go down, they've still got to see it as a penalty. So, um, But, you know, Seamus keep doing exactly the same because that's you know, not part of his game more. In your day, if one of your teammates was a diver, you'd surely pull him to one side, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, yeah the boys would uh, have something to say. Stop diving around, you... you you're creating nonsense for us on the pitch. You're embarrassing yourself. You're embarrassing us as as players. Just pick yourself up, get on with it. And, uh, and there weren't that many in our time dived us, so we didn't have a problem with it really. It's a very difficult reputation to shake off as well. Well, the next step in finishing strongly to the season is to beat Southampton at Goodison on Saturday. To discuss that game, we caught up with Roberto's right-hand man Graham Jones at Finch Farm earlier this week. First, to look at Southampton's evolving tactics this season. Started slowly, um, obviously the Euro Europa League commitment early on. Um, we found the Europa League uh, a great competition, um, but I think it does affect your league form. They came out of it quite early as well, I think one of the qualifying rounds. Uh, they've been a slow burner really. Um, I think that season had a real upturn in fortunes when they went to a back three. Uh, I think. Um, one or two sides have um, played their back, back three quite well recently and got some wins. 
I think they've had uh, two team selections where they've used the back three in the last six games, so back four at the weekend against Newcastle. So they've had a productive season, um, but obviously not having a great run in the Cups helps you focus on the Premier League. Do you go into that game thinking we'll lose a back three against us or we'll lose a back four then? Is that what you're thinking? Um, I'm not sure at this point. Obviously, they'll watch our game at uh, Crystal Palace and I would imagine uh, they might set up accordingly. Um, I looked at one of the fixtures and a team they were playing against played a front two and they went back to a back three. And So I think all them factors uh, have to come into consideration. So I'm just really interested in, it, in our side, really. Sheeds, people might look at the Premier League table and look at the fixtures we've got left and think maybe they don't matter, but it's so important to finish the season. Go into the summer on a high, isn't it? Every game matters. Uh, you know, playing at Goodison Park, you've got an expectant crowd that want you to win, expect you to win. So, uh, And you, you get confidence in winning games, so certainly we've still got plenty to play for. Starting against Southampton, it will be a difficult test. They've got a top manager in uh, Ronald Koeman, who's tactically very astute. So it will be a tough game for us, but it's one of the, those the players have got to go out, roll their sleeves up and, and get the results. We beat them 3-0 back in August, mm -hmm. nods at their place. We do well to beat them 3-0 again. We will, but it were a, it were a really good performance mm. down there. Uh, played really well, counter attacked them really quickly. Uh, but uh, yeah, they've been different. There'll be different opposition. Uh, they're playing quite well. They've had some good results lately. So it'll be a difficult game. But like Kev says, um, I'm not saying the lads are playing for a semi final place. They're not. But every game, every Evertonian expects you to win. So the lads have got to go out there, as he said, roll the sleeves up. And, uh, and get at Southampton and hopefully collect three points. The semi-final must be some sort of motivation though, Sheeds. I'm sure the gaffer will be saying, look, nothing's finalised yet. There's places up for grabs. Indeed, performances uh, pick your team. So if players are playing well and they're, they're contributing and goal scorers are scoring, defenders are defending, then, then it makes the manager's job a lot easier. So it is a, it is a carrot for the players to, to perform at whichever team he picks between now and, and Wembley. And it's a, it's a great occasion to, to play in and every player wants to play in it. It was a good win for Manchester United at Upton Park, wasn't it? Yeah, terrific, because uh, I expected West Ham to beat them. I really did. I thought they did the hard work at Old Trafford and I thought they'd finish the job at, uh, at West Ham. But I thought Man United, particularly the boy Rashford, uh, took his goal exceptionally well. Uh, they get him man of the match on TV as well, so he is an handful. Uh, it'd be a difficult game, but one I'm, I'm quite confident about beating. And you know, my fellow scored as well. He did, he did. Well, more from Graham Jones now, and this time he's discussing the psychological effects of what was a superb 3-0 win at St Mary's, as we said, back at the start of the season. Well, it was, and I think uh, you see an Everton side that was hungry, uh, fresh, um, and um, we've got to get that, uh, that feeling back because um, recent games against Manchester and Arsenal, it's not been there. It was a bit better at the weekend, I thought, with a better side against Watford. Um, and in trying to win the game, it was a bit open. So 1-1 one, one in the end, I thought, was uh, more of a fair result. I thought it was slightly the better side. Um, but Saturday against Southampton, it's a home game. We want to win our home games, and that's the plan. Can a, can a win, such a positive win, have a positive effect mentally when you come to play that team again for a second time? Yeah, I think so. They'll be aware of uh, the damage we done down there because um, those three goals quite quickly and the game was finished. So you don't lose that. There's a certain amount of respect their players will give to ours. Just we need to make sure we perform the same way. As next week's show will be all about the FA Cup semi-final, but you two won't be here. We'll get your thoughts on it now very quickly, Kev. Looking forward to it? Very much so. It's, um, when I played the... the, the Semi-finals are at neutral grounds, but mm. it's obviously the capacity that they can hold, more supporters can go, which is only right. Um, and it's the uh, where dreams are made of, and it's, you know players will, uh, can go there and you know do unexpected things, and that's that's what semi-finals are all about. So, um, forty, I never lost in a semi-final. I would know it'd be heartbreaking if you did to be one step, you know, from the final. So I'm sure everyone will give it their best shot, and it's uh, it's a great opportunity for us. Some occasions not on it. Yeah, um, um, and we're not going down there just to enjoy the day. We want to go back uh, in May and we want to go and win that trophy. It's really important to the club. So we'll be, we'll be positive, the fans will be positive and hopefully the boys can put in a performance that we beat Man United and we get, we get ourselves back down there come May. How good is it when Wembley's half blue? Oh, dear me, 
it's fantastic. It really is fantastic. I'm just looking forward to the scenes going down there as well. We're all looking forward to that one. And that's it for another jam-packed Everton show. My thanks to Kevin Sheedy for joining me and Snods this week. Terrific company, as always. And don't forget that full commentary of Saturday's game against Southampton will be on EvertonFC.com with me and Snods. And I can tell you, that's well worth a listen. Enjoy your weekend and thanks for joining us this week on another Everton show.